Imagine a jet hitting Mach 2 from a cold start in seconds. It was cheaper, faster, and every ally wanted it. But instead of a victory, Washington strangled the project. Why kill your own perfect fighter? Today, we're looking at the F-20 Tiger Shark, the incredible jet that was too good to be allowed to live. Chapter 1. The Legend of the Little Fighter That Could To understand why the F-20 was so special, we have to look at where it came from. Back in the early 1960s, the world was a very different place. The Cold War was heating up, and the United States needed a way to help its allies defend themselves. But there was a catch. The US didn't want to give its most advanced technology to just anyone. They were afraid that if a high-tech jet crashed behind enemy lines, the Soviets would steal the secrets. The solution was the F-5 Freedom Fighter. It was a small, simple, twin-engine jet designed by a company called Northrop. It wasn't the biggest or the fastest, but it was incredibly agile and very easy to keep running. It was the everyman's fighter jet. Pilots loved it because it was fun to fly. Even Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier, said the F-5 was the most fun he ever had in a cockpit. The F-5 became a massive hit. Over 2,000 of them were built and sold to air forces all over the globe, from Switzerland to South Korea. But by the late 1970s, the F-5 was starting to show its age. The Soviet Union was handing out newer, faster MiGs to its friends, and America's allies were starting to get outgunned. They needed an upgrade. They needed a plane that had the simplicity of the F-5, but the punch of a modern heavyweight. That is when Northrop decided to take their proven design and turn it into a monster. Chapter 2. Building the Perfect Beast Northrop's plan was simple. Take the F-5 airframe and fix everything that made it feel old. The biggest change was the heart of the plane, the engine. The original F-5 used two small engines. Northrop ripped those out and replaced them with one massive General Electric F404 turbofan. This was the same engine used in the F/A 18 Hornet, and it was a total game changer. This single engine gave the plane 60% more thrust than the old ones combined. Suddenly, this light fighter had a thrust to weight ratio of 1.13. In plain English, it had more power than it had weight. It could point its nose at the sky and accelerate straight up like a rocket. It could hit Mach 2 without breaking a sweat. But Northrop didn't stop there. They gave it a new digital brain, a fly-by-wire system that made the plane incredibly stable and easy to handle at high speeds. Then there was the radar. The F-20 was fitted with the AN slash APG-67 radar, which was state-of-the-art for the time. For the first time, a small export fighter could see enemies from 50 miles away and fire missiles that could hit them before they even saw the F-20 on their own screens. This was called Beyond Visual Range Capability, and it was something that even the early versions of the famous F-16 couldn't do. But the real magic of the F-20 wasn't just how fast it flew, it was how fast it started. Most fighter jets of that era took several minutes to get their systems warmed up and ready for takeoff. The F-20 used a special ring laser gyroscope for navigation that could align itself in just 22 seconds. Northrop boasted that the F-20 had the fastest scramble time in the world. From the moment the pilot jumped into the seat to the moment the wheels left the runway was less than a minute. It was the perfect interceptor. If an enemy plane was spotted on radar, the F-20 would be in the air and hunting it down before the enemy even realised they were in trouble. Chapter 3. The fighter that was too good to sell. With a plane this good, Northrop thought they had a guaranteed winner. And they weren't the only ones. The US government actually asked for a plane like this. Under President Jimmy Carter, 
there was a policy called the FX program. The idea was to create a middle tier fighter that allies could buy. It had to be better than the old F-5, but it couldn't have the super secret tech used in the US Air Force's top line jets. The F-20 fit this bill perfectly. It was a private project, meaning Northrop spent over a billion dollars of their own money to build it. They didn't ask the taxpayers for a single cent. They were so confident that they hired Chuck Yeager to be the face of the plane. In commercials, Jaeger would stand in front of the tiger shark and tell the world that it was a pilot's airplane. He praised how reliable it was and how you could push it to the limit without the engine stalling. But then the politics started to shift. In 1980, Ronald Reagan became president and he had a very different view of the world. He wanted to push American power to the max. Instead of selling allies middle tier fighters, his administration started allowing the sale of the US Air Force's own frontline fighter, the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon. This put the F-20 in an impossible spot. Suddenly, Northrop wasn't competing against other export planes. They were competing against the F-16, which was backed by the full weight of the US Air Force. Think about it from the perspective of a foreign general. You could buy the F-20, which was an amazing plane, but the US Air Force didn't use it. Or you could buy the F-16, which the Americans flew every day. Even if the F-20 was cheaper to run and faster to launch, the F-16 had the prestige of being the real thing. Chapter 4. The Bureaucratic Chokehold This is where the story gets really frustrating. Northrop wasn't just fighting a rival company, they were fighting their own government. Because the F-20 was part of the FX program, Northrop wasn't allowed to market the plane directly to other countries. All the sales had to go through the State Department. Imagine trying to sell a product, but you're not allowed to talk to your customers. Instead, you have to let a government office do it for you. And that government office didn't really care about your product. In fact, they seemed to prefer the F-16. Northrop had to submit every single brochure and every single ant to the government for review, a process that could take months. Meanwhile, General Dynamics was flying all over the world, showing off the F-16 and making deals. The State Department was so lackadaisical about the F-20 that Northrop officials started to realize they were being sabotaged. During a congressional hearing, a general even admitted that the Air Force wasn't actively marketing the F-20 at all. They had sold hundreds of planes to dozens of countries, but not a single one was an F-20. It gets even worse. The US government started giving money to Israel to help them build their own fighter jet, the Lavai. So, while Northrop was spending its own private money to build a plane for the US government to sell, the government was using tax dollars to fund a foreign competitor that would steal Northrop's customers. It was a total betrayal of the company that had tried to do everything by the book. Chapter 5. The Poor Man's Fighter Myth. One of the biggest lies that killed the F-20 was the idea that it was a second-rate plane. Because it was designed for export, people started calling it the Poor Man's F-16. This label stuck, even though in many ways, the F-20 was actually better. On paper, the F-20 was a dream come true for any air force. It used 53% less fuel than its competitors. It required 52% less manpower to keep it in the air. It was four times more reliable than the standard frontline jets of the day. In a world where fighter jets are incredibly expensive and complicated, the F-20 was a breath of fresh air. It was a jet that actually worked when you needed it to. But the second tier reputation was hard to shake. When the Reagan administration started selling F-16 to Pakistan, other countries like Venezuela and Turkey decided they didn't want the cheap option anymore. They wanted the same top-of-the-line gear that the US was giving out. Even if the F-20 was a better fit for their needs, 
especially since most of these countries were already flying the older F5 and could have transitioned to the F20 easily, they chose the F16 for the prestige. Northrop tried to fight back. They offered the F-20 to the U.S. Navy and Air Force for special roles. They suggested the F-20 would be perfect for aggressor training, where U.S. pilots practice against planes that act like enemy MiGs. The F-20 was perfect for this because it was small, fast and nimble, just like a Soviet fighter. But the Navy chose a modified F-16 instead. There were even rumours that General Dynamics sold those F-16S to the Navy at a loss just to make sure Northrop didn't get a foot in the door. Everywhere Northrop turned, the door was being slammed in their face by people who wanted to protect the F-16's monopoly. Chapter 6. Tragedy in the air. As if the political battle wasn't enough, disaster struck during the testing phase. To sell a plane to a foreign country, you have to show them what it can do. Northrop took the F-20 on a world tour, performing daring air shows to prove its agility, but the plane was almost too agile for its own good. In October 1984, the first F-20 prototype was performing a demonstration flight in South Korea. During a high G maneuver, the pilot, Darrell Cornell, blacked out and crashed. He didn't survive, then only seven months later, another tragedy happened. The second prototype was practicing for the Paris Air Show in Canada. The pilot, Dave Barnes, also blacked out during a maneuver and crashed. Investigations into both crashes found the same thing. There was nothing wrong with the plane. The engines worked perfectly and the airframe didn't fail. The problem was G-lock, G-force induced loss of consciousness. The F-20 was so nimble and its engine was so powerful that it could pull turns tighter than the human body could handle. The pilots were blacking out because the plane was performing at a level that was literally beyond human limits. While these crashes weren't the fault of the design, they were a public relations nightmare. Potential buyers started to worry that the plane was dangerous. Even though the same thing could happen in an F-16, the F-20 didn't have a massive military using it to prove otherwise. These accidents gave the critics the perfect excuse to push the project further into the shadows. Chapter 7. The Final Betrayal By 1986, Northrop was desperate. They had one last chance to save the Tiger Shark. They offered it to the Air National Guard. This made a lot of sense. The Air National Guard's main job is defending the US coastline. They need a plane that can sit on a runway and launch the second an unidentified plane is spotted. As we already talked about, the F-20 was the fastest launching plane in the world. It was also cheap to operate, which is great for the National Guard's budget. Northrop argued that the F-20 was a perfect fit. It could fire the Sparrow missile for long-range combat, which the F-16 still couldn't do at that time. It seemed like a slam dunk, but the Air Force had other plans. They wanted the National Guard to fly the same planes as the regular Air Force to keep things simple. They decided to take older F-16s and upgrade them instead of buying the brand new F-20s. On October 31st, 1986, the Air Force made the announcement they were going with the F-16. This was the final blow. Without a US customer, no other country was willing to take the risk on the F-20. Within weeks, Northrop officially cancelled the program. They had spent over $1.2 billion of their own money and had nothing to show for it but three prototypes and a lot of broken promises. Chapter 8. Why the F-20 matters today. You might be wondering why we are still talking about a plane from the 1980s that never even went into production. It's because the story of the F-20 is a warning about how the military-industrial complex really works. The Tiger Shark didn't fail because it was a bad plane. It failed because it was too efficient. It was a threat to the status quo. If the F-20 had succeeded, 
it would have proven that you don't always need the most expensive, most complicated jet to get the job done. It would have shown that a smaller, smarter and cheaper plane could be just as lethal. Think about the fighter jets we have today. The F-35 is famous for being incredibly expensive and having a lot of technical problems. It's a jack of all trades that costs a fortune to maintain. Looking back at the F-20, you have to wonder what could have been. If the US had supported the Tiger Shark, our allies might have had a powerful, affordable fleet of planes that were always ready to fly. We might have avoided the trap of building planes that are so expensive we can only afford a few of them. The irony is that the F-20 was ahead of its time. Today, there is a huge market for what people call light combat aircraft. Countries are realizing they don't always need a $100 million stealth fighter to patrol their borders. Planes like the JF-17 or the KAIT-50 are basically modern versions of what the F-20 was trying to be 40 years ago. Even the radar from the F-20 ended up being used in other successful jets like Taiwan's indigenous defense fighter. Chapter 9, The Ghost in the Museum. If you want to see the last F-20 Tiger Shark for yourself, you have to go to the California Science Center in Los Angeles. It sits there, silent and still, a reminder of a future that never happened. When you look at its sleek lines and that massive engine, it's easy to see why pilots like Chuck Yeager were so excited about it. It looks fast even when it's parked. The F-20 was the right plane at the wrong time, created for a market that was destroyed by politics. It was a technical masterpiece that was killed by bureaucrats who were more interested in protecting their favourite programmes than in giving the world a better fighter jet. It's a story of what happens when engineering excellence meets a wall of government red tape. America killed the F-20, but they couldn't kill the idea behind it. The need for a simple, reliable and powerful fighter jet is still there. As we move into an era of drones and high-tech warfare, the lessons of the Tiger Shark are more important than ever. Sometimes the best solution isn't the most expensive one. Sometimes the perfect fighter is the one that actually works when you need it to. The final scramble, so was the F-20 a missed opportunity? Almost everyone who flew it says yes. It was a plane that did everything it was asked to do and more. It outperformed the F-16 in scramble time and reliability, and it held its own in a dogfight. It was the perfect export fighter that was simply too good for its own country to let it live. The next time you hear about a new military project that is billions of dollars over budget and years behind schedule, think about the F-20 Tiger Shark. Think about the plane that was built with private money, finished ahead of schedule, and worked perfectly on the very first day. And then ask yourself, why aren't we building planes like that anymore? Thanks for watching this deep dive into the greatest fighter never made. If you enjoyed this story of aviation history and political intrigue, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more.